You're welcome to this preview of Reversing Hermon Session 8, The Watcher's Sin and Women's Head Covering. Learning Objectives By the end of this session, we shall be able to explain head covering in 1 Corinthians 11.10, the phrase, because of angels, and pre-scientific ideas found in the Bible. A question addressed to the Apostle Paul, which he answers in this section, if men do not cover their head in church gatherings, then why must women do so? The statue of the Emperor Augustus, who reigned between 63 BC and AD 14, was discovered at the city of Corinth. Augustus covered his head only when praying or sacrificing to the gods. We begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Every husband's chief is Christ, every wife's chief is her husband, and Christ's chief is God. The term for husband, aner, can mean an adult man, husband, or even Adam. The term for wife, gune, can be an adult woman, a wife, or Eve herself. The term chief translates kephale, which can mean head, leader, or protector. <clears throat> the image is that of God's glory reflected in marriage. Just as God shares his glory and Christ reflects God's glory, the two being of equal status, so a husband reflects Christ's glory and his wife reflects her husband's glory, both of these being of equal status. How is this preacher dressed? Note his head covering. Any man praying or prophesying with his head covered dishonors his chief. But we understand that Christian Gentile men were not to cover their head as the pagans did, for they had direct access to God by faith in Jesus. However, Christian Jews were free to cover their head. What about this preacher? How is she dressed? Verse 5 reads, And any woman praying or prophesying with her head uncovered dishonors her chief, because she is the same as a shaven woman. Prophecy simply means to speak aloud in a religious gathering, and shaven was a sign of shame or disgrace, which reflected badly upon a woman's husband. Notice the activity in this house church meeting. Leaping over to chapter 14 for a moment, we read in verse 26, My brothers and sisters, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, all forms of prophecy. When they're together, that is, Christian men and women may worship together and all may prophesy. Couples do not have to sit together. Continuing in chapter 14, Paul wrote, Women, in the plural, should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to chatter, but should be subordinate, as even the civil law says. By silent he meant not chattering as a separate group, and not asking random questions. By subordinate he means women follow the same instructions which men follow. Back to chapter 11, I mean, if a woman does not cover her head, then she may as well shave her head. But if she would feel ashamed to cut or shave her hair, then she should cover her head. When he says, if, Paul uses a construction that assumes this to be so. Note again, 
In this ancient statue, the one about to sacrifice wears a head covering. So a man ought not to cover his head, since he reflects God's image and glory, and a wife reflects her husband's glory or honor. In the Greco-Roman polytheism of the time, both men and women covered their head when praying or sacrificing. However, Gentile Christian men broke with that tradition. What do you see in this picture? Now remember, Adam was not made from Eve, rather Eve from a man. And God did not create the man because of the woman, but the woman because of the man. This is why a wife ought to have an authority sign on her head because of the angels. Note the construction because of. The man needed the woman for reproductive purposes. So, what is meant here by the angels? Remember what we read back in Genesis chapter 6 about the sons of God and the daughters of men. So here are some current theories as to what Paul meant when he said, because of angels. There are those who suggest that this word should be translated messengers, that is, leaders visiting from other churches who might not understand the head covering. Others prefer to suggest that these are guardian angels that God has assigned to ensure worship and moral purity in churches. Others say, well, it's the seraphim who are worshiping God up in heaven. Thus, when Christians are worshiping, they join with the angels who are worshiping God in heaven. However, in the context of Scripture, references to the book of Genesis, and of the great transgression committed by angels, Paul is likely referring to the watchers, that is, spirit beings like those who sinned with human women in antiquity. And certainly he does not want Christian women to tempt those angels to do anything similar again. Anyway, a wife is no greater than her husband, nor a husband greater than his wife. Likewise, as God made Eve from Adam, so men are born from women, and God made everything. By his reference to Adam and Eve, Paul again appeals to the book of Genesis. He goes on to say, Judge for yourselves, and poses a query. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? He leaves the answer to the Christians. When he says judge, is he implying that each church decides its own customs? In fact, every church must do so. Now let's recall three levels of authority in churches for decision making. First, in Scripture we find Jesus and his apostles' commands, and we Christians, we obey Jesus and his apostles. Jesus said, baptize believers, so we baptize believers. Secondly, there were the apostles' practices. Now we Christians, we are free to follow those same practices on condition that they are culturally acceptable and meaningful. Now the apostles often baptized new believers the same day on which they believed. However, we are not required to do so, but we may. And thirdly, there are our church traditions that we have agreed on. We may follow any church traditions, again, provided that those do not hinder our obeying Jesus and his apostles. For example, some churches baptize by immersing an individual three times. That's a church tradition. Would that hinder our obeying Jesus? This image 
generated with the assistance of Microsoft Copilot is that of a first century Middle Eastern man of about 33 years old wearing a typical hairstyle and short beard. Of whom does this remind you? So Paul continues, society itself teaches you, on the one hand, that people dishonor men who have long hair. In those days, it did so. The term here, translated society, fusis, in some contexts means nature, but here means just how things are, that is, the accepted cultural traits of your society. And in what way do they dishonor men with long hair? Again, in those days, in that society, men with long hair were viewed as weak, effeminate, easily conquered. Now regarding women in a church gathering. And on the other hand, people honor women who have long hair. In those days, they simply did. It was commonly believed that women's long hair was part of her gender. Therefore, women were to treat their long hair with modesty. Now what about this woman, her hair uncovered, proclaiming the word of God? Verse 16, now, if anyone seems to want to oppose this view, then inform him that we apostles have no other hair custom, nor do God's other churches. When he says we, he uses the emphatic pronoun, that is, Paul and his companions who were writing this letter. Women's head covering is still practiced in many countries of the world today. Let's look at some of the abusive uses of head covering. There is some ecclesial abuse, where Christian women must submit to church tradition or clergy. Marital abuse, when Christian women must submit to fathers and husbands in every aspect of life. There are legalists who simply say, God commanded it, so women must do it. And then there's the religious abuse, where women must submit to a religious male to be saved by God. No head covering, no salvation. Now, head covering was widely practiced in Mesopotamian countries. Let's look at some of the prevalent beliefs in Mesopotamia. There was polytheism, having many different gods, each one with divine control over weather, fertility, health, agriculture, and then belief in the afterlife, usually some kind of a gloomy existence in the underworld. Folk believed in omens and divination, that certain objects and rites could reveal the future and astrology, assuming that celestial movements influence human and natural events, and divine retribution, that the gods punish human beings. These beliefs led to a number of practices, including the following. Honor shame, a main motivator in human relations. Communal decision-making, a patriarchal order in which older men preside over most gatherings. Ritual purity, trying to restore access to the gods. The honoring of kings as gods. Idolatry, setting up of idols and temples, objects where the gods might come inhabit. And sacrifice, destroying things or lives to honor or placate those gods. This led to a Mesopotamian worldview reflected in the Bible, including creation occurring in six days, including the first humans, Adam and Eve. The great flood which destroyed the watchers from heaven 
and their giant offspring. The Tower of Babel, when God caused languages to multiply. Miracles of healing, walking on water, divine provisions, and much more. A cosmology that viewed the earth as flat and the sky as a kind of dome. Whether they believed it or not, that's the way they described it. And many kinds of spirits, including gods, angels, ghosts, demons, and others. And prophecy, the foretelling of the future. Lastly, we mention incarnation, when gods become human beings. This leads then to a challenge for those who wish to understand and teach the Bible. We must learn ancient languages, how they're formed, how they work, and then read their literature, discovering their styles, discourse patterns, logic, and so forth. Then we have to translate that by finding equivalent meanings in our modern languages, coming to understand their worldview, that is, ancient beliefs about unseen reality, what lies behind the visible world. To extract truth from that ancient literature, making application for modern worldviews, that we might know the living God and the wonderful provisions that he has made for us. Your assignment for next time is to read in Reversing Hermon, Chapter 9, The Watcher's Sin and Baptism, and then visit our website, reversinghermon.site. Thank you.